this is the conscious way. This is the conscious way of looking at. And you know what? When you discover this conscious way of looking at life, your heart always grateful. And in that gratefulness, we acknowledge the interconnectedness of all this. So why is this happening? Because we are interconnected. The discovery of interconnectedness is at the base of every experience we have. Every experience that you have, if you understand the wave of relationships, this is why in the Hindu treatises we call it Indra's net. Heaven is an interconnected, this connection that we discover in quantum physics, which is called non-locality because it's instantly interconnected with our signals. In the olden days, they used to call it Indra's net because heaven is ruled by Indra, and what is Indra is net is all instantly interconnected. Okay? So it says you have got this kind of thinking too. And is this why we don't need signals yet? Need to? You don't need this signal because we are done, right? We are done. We are what you connect with. So in, in this way. So gradually shift the shift the causal connections instead of cognition, causality of the macro world that you create because machines are shifted to other machines and years and years and years and that way. This is another world. Same concept is from when you tune into this, that's the key to becoming coordinates. Yes, please. Is it also entanglement which is meant here? Yeah. What we mean by quantum connection triggered or correlation is also an entanglement. We become causally entangled that way. So the next question that we ask, of course, is this question of how does the undivided, how does that undivided unconscious become divided into one part that sees the other part separate from itself? In other words, the basic concept of Maya, Maya is the agent of separateness. How does Maya act? How does Maya separate come about. Okay? This turns out is the same question as Ramana Maharshi used to ask, who am I? This is also the same question that self-realization implies. Who am I really? Because the scientists, the behaviorists, they are called in psychology, scientists have a model for we too. Because the scientist looks at our behavior, and scientists say that the behavior is quite predictable. It's quite predictable from the history of our upbringing, from the history of the memories that we have. I already said that we have brain memories that come from our animal ancestry that we call negative emotional brain circuit. And by knowing that, scientists already can predict that some of us will revive and some of us will have anger and maybe all of us will have this negative emotion. That's a scientific picture of ourselves. You have your hands up. I'm a Okay. 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 So, um, you mentioned who am I in. Uh, two questions. Who am I and who am I? Yeah. One mind is the, is the oneness. Yeah. Right? It's also called one mind, one consciousness. We have to be a little bit careful about um, about the distinction. So we are distinguishing between mind and consciousness just as a matter of scientific convenience. Mind is the vehicle of mental object, monash. Okay? When we say one mind, we call it consciousness. Just a name. So don't use the word one mind. I know it's very common, but this is a different connotation than mind. Sanskrit is beautiful because Sanskrit creates a different Sanskrit than the word mind, manas, and there is also the word chitta, place where awareness takes place. But that's only conscious awareness. There is also the unconscious, no awareness, right? And that is what in Buddhist tradition called no mind, no awareness. 
in Sanskrit you call it Brahma. Sanskrit you call it? Government is that undivided or unconscious. How do you explain uh, Maya in quantum physics? <coughs> Maya. Yeah, now I'm getting to Maya. So, what is Maya? How does this I come about? How does the separateness come about? This is the big, 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 big question. Remember from the quantum measurement point of view, where is this question coming from? Quantum measurement, I said, in the presence of observer, measurement happens. <coughs> then I said the observer has consciousness. Then I argued with the help of von Neumann and Wigner, paradoxes arise. If we think of consciousness as dualism, if we think of consciousness as individual, if we think consciousness as brain product, we get into paradox. These are called quantum measurement paradox. All these paradoxes can be solved by saying that consciousness is one and that choice happens from one consciousness. Consciousness chooses a particular facet of a wave of possibility and that facet becomes actuality, solve all the problems. That does it. There's one problem still left, which is the problem of the brain. So let's look at that. Is there any denying that brain is a material object? Yes. How can you deny it? Yes. Absolutely. Yes. So, observer brain is also possible. So again we get into that same paragraph, possibility, looking at possibility, looking at possibility. But somehow, that encounter we undeniably cannot reduce the possibility into actuality. But they can, they can. So the realization must happen to all thinking people that brain is a very special kind of possibility. Brain is a very special kind of possibility. It's not the usual reductive kind of possibility that can be broken down into its parts. We can break down a bigger counter into its parts and we can deconstruct it again. We try to break down the brain into its parts and try to reconstruct, try it, it will never work. It will never work. Because the brain, there is something that cannot be reduced to its parts. And that is the part, same thing with the living cell. There is something that cannot be reduced to its part. And that is the part, that is the thing that makes the brain a brain and the living cell alive. And that is the part that we are missing. So what part is it? What kind of part is it that gives this kind of thing, makes it an irreducible whole? The whole, whole is did not did not shout in vain. They had the right idea, except that they were applying it in this community to everything. That is not true. Only certain things are an irreducible whole. Not everything. This is not an irreducible whole. What's the difference between a chair and a brain? A chair can be reduced to its component molecules, atoms, 
when the material particle of sun reconstructed back. If you try to do that with the brain, you find that they have killed the brain. They have killed the living cell. They are not getting that life back. You can put it back in the way it was, but life will not come back. So, and still in the brain, attention will not return to the future. Maybe it is so cold. And somehow, somehow, this irreducible whole is creating separate. That of course I understand. This irreducible whole is what is special about the brain that can differentiate between a brain and a chair, but it still does not tell us why, why consciousness get caught in it. When consciousness chooses from the possibilities of a guy who conquered, it's not getting caught in it. It's not identified with the guide counter. The guide counter is not saying, oh, I see. It's saying nothing. It's enough. It's life. It's your own. In animal. But we, with the brain, we are saying, I see you as separate from myself. Where did that, that power come from? There must be something in the brain which captures consciousness. Consciousness gets caught in. So, <clears throat> what kind of system has that kind of ability? Let's look at a set that is called liar. I am a liar. Think about it. Think, think, think. I am a liar. Initially, it's just a state. So I lie. So I strongly, every human being is lying. Every human being lies. Nothing special. But be special. Look at it more incisive. I am a liar. It's a tricky sign. If I am a liar, I'm telling the truth. I am a liar. I'm telling the truth. But if I am telling the truth, then I am a liar. <laughs> that is the truth. But if I am a liar, then I'm telling the truth. And if I'm telling the truth, I am a liar. So every time I reach the end, I go back to the beginning. Every time I reach the beginning, I go back to the end. So what has happened? I go between end and the beginning, and go on and go on and go on. This lesson has circularity. It is a circular logic in which I have gotten captured. So long as I stay in the circular logic, I won't be able to get out. I have to remind myself consciously. After all, I don't live in the world of that quiet world. I'm fortunate, so I can jump out of it. If you give this riddle to a child, he or she may not be so happy. They start crying sometimes because they don't know that they can jump out of it. So that's the mystery of the brain having something like this. So let's try to discover it. You know that brain perceives and perception produces memory. So brain has an apparatus. We are very loose about it. We, we don't know the nature of exactly this apparatus is that of there. Brain is much too complicated. But we are getting there. So we have this perception apparatus. That much we know that Something that begins with the eye and produces an image in the retina. That image is processed by the rest of the brain, becomes an electrical image. And somehow, now it's the, it's the part that, that's really subtle. Somehow, this image produces the impression of an eye seeing that original object that produced the image. But you see, that's a huge jump, because this image is an electrical image. When I see you, I should really see what? I see you, but how? What is created in the brain is an electrical image. That's not you. The retinal image, we have another idea. We can, we can take the retina out and see what kind of image retina creates. Retina creates really a small replica of it. 
Well, that's not what the rest of the brain processes. The rest of the brain creates an electrical image of, of that retinal image. But I'm not saying that. I'm saying you. Not only that, who am I? Am I a okay, little green orbit, you know, little homunculus? That's a philosopher's name for this little being that we used to imagine, that looks at the television screen, that has created the image of you, this beautiful lady. Right? Is that like that? No, obviously we are not that simple to believe that. Because then the question comes, who is the, what is the human goodness that is looking at this human goodness? And then what looks at the next human goodness, right? It's an infinite number of human culi looking at each other and creating horrible picture. What's the answer? There is no answer. In that way of looking, you never are going to find an answer. What is the answer? So the answer that is emerging from here, up there, is that there is a perception apparatus, but the perception apparatus is not a pure perception apparatus. If it was, then we would be forever riddled with this problem. What is the perception apparatus? What looks at it? That becomes the subject. And why did the, why did this connotation of that it is a subject arising? Because it's still all objects, right? So the construction has to be why? Thank 
Angle higher. Very interesting work. Don't uh, confuse it with entanglement. That's an important word too. That's like that two objects correlated to have that non-local transfer of information without signal. That's the connotation there. Here, the connotation is different. Usually, when I have hierarchy, like I am a father, and I have a son. And the order usually, when the son is born, goes from father to the son. Right? India especially, fathers are a little authoritative. In the older days, husbands used to be like that too. Husbands control the wife, or vice versa, two wives control their husband. But it's always one hand, right? Patriarchy, we call the father controlling. Matriarchy, we call mother controlling. Head husband, we call the wife controlling. And husband dominating is the usual, there's no name for it, that's just assumed, etc., etc. Elementary particles creating atoms, creating molecules, that's a simple pattern. All the causal authority is in the elementary part. However much the molecular biologist said that genes creates us, it's not the gene. It's the elementary part. Right? Genes have no authority over the elementary part. The elementary part was controlled by the genes, can or cannot. Very important to recognize. Genetic determinism is by name only. It's really elementary particle determinism of the time. Brain is fundamentally different. As soon as the surplanity has taken place, it's no longer elementary particles that has control over what the brain can or cannot do. Instead, what has happened? That consciousness when it enters the brain, in order to choose from the brain possibilities, it becomes caught in the brain, in the brain's tangled habit. Once it is caught, it cannot get out. Why can't it get out? Because look at the situation. By getting caught in it, consciousness now thinks that it is separate from the rest of the world. Just as when you got caught into that sense, you cannot come out, what does that mean? That means you have separated yourself, identified yourself with the sense, and you are separate from the rest of the world. Same thing happens to the to consciousness which gets captured in the brain, in the strangled hierarchy of the brain. It thinks that it's separate from the rest of the world and calls itself the I, see, you, separate from me, and this is why I call myself I. So why am I, I, I am I, and you are an object? Because I see you that way. I'm not seeing my brain anymore separate from me. I'm instead identifying with the brain. Very strange, no? Because brain was an object before. Now we don't see the brain. When we collapse, once we manifest, we don't see the brain. Brain has disappeared. Instead, we identify with the brain. Brain is nowhere in the picture. I say, I see the electron, I see you. And that's the way that the I has been created. Okay. Mystics who discovered the nature of the I this way in the experience that in India is called Samadhi. See this very clearly. They see that the I is arising spontaneously with the object that I experience. Then the ordinary experience is not very clear. Bhagavad Gita has a beautiful chapter on it. If you read chapter 13 of the Bhagavad Gita, you'll find that uh, it says that the experiencer, the experience and the field of experience, the word, all becomes sort of saying, samadhi, samadhi, then putting 
the experience of the experiencer, the experience, and the field of experience takes on a sort of almost like a one, not quite, that's still experience itself. So experience is happening. So it's not like Brahman, but in those moments we realize that Atma, is individuality, I, is arising from Brahman. Atman is Brahman. The individual soul is the great soul, oneness. This is why it's called realizing me in its such self-realization. So that's the great realization of our true nature or self. When we say our ego, what has happened is that we have gone through these memories and that produces a certain amount of conditioning. How? We'll go through that later. But let's just say that memories produce conditioning, memories produce a tendency to see things, see things as we saw them before, and that's what psychologists call conditioning. Our experiences modify our perception to see the way that we have seen before. As soon as that has happened, the world changes. The world is no longer forever new. The world is tainted by how we have seen the world before. And gradually, we see also that when we see certain things, we have to behave in a certain way. When we are with our parents, we behave one way. When we are with our friends, we behave another way. And so we take only a selected aspect of those memories, selected aspect of our conditioning, and learn to develop personalities of behaving differently in different conditions. So what does that make you? You are the head honcho. You have different conditionings, different programs, so to speak. Sometimes you identify with this program, sometimes you identify with those programs, sometimes you identify with this program, depending on the situation you are in, you are choosing different programs to act. These things we call personality. So we have first unconditioned self of the tango hierarchy. This is what we call quantum self appropriation. Very quantum, always changing, always new, never conditioned, unconditioned, up one transfer. And then we have the conditioned ego. But still, very authentic. Conditioning is nothing but a pattern of habit. No pretension. It's still authentic. But then we think pretension. I can, I'm, I'm, I'm reacting with one way with the audience here because I'm the speaker of the audience. And then I go out and nobody knows me and immediately I become ordinary. I change and then I'm a bunch of other people again situation and then another behavior from me and I'm choosing this different behavior. So I seem to be acting as the head honcho of a chair. I put on different masks and I do it like depending on my volition. Like I seem to be the head honcho of my chair. I have a whole chair of experiences, the way I want to experience things and I'm choosing the particular eye that I want to be. So I have become a simple hierarchy of choosing who I will be. The tangled hierarchical ego in the process has been made into a symbol hierarchy of experiencing things and the corruption of the eye is gone. And it's at that level we say, ah, Maya has taken So Maya is the agent of separateness. First, the separateness is very, very little. What is called this? kind of explanation as dependent co arise I talked before about drishti before srishti and srishti before drishti, observing before creation or creation before observation. This is resolved in Buddhism by saying neither. Dependent co arise of creation and observation. The quantum physics agrees with Buddhism. Yes, it is Paktija. <coughs> Subject and object arise together out of the same event of quantum. 
subject and object are co-creations of consciousness. Who creates consciousness that? Who creates that unseparate consciousness? That's the source of all totality. It's always Brahman. It's always made unconscious. In all local wonders. This is why the ultimate realization of the issues of the Purushas is that even his birth, the Bhattal agent, which is called God normally in English, even God is under Maya. What a wisdom. God the Creator, that normally is acknowledged as Creator, the Vishnu is acknowledged as God is under Maya. Because the little bit of it is already there's also its potentiality. So this Maya then acts at a different level and gradually brings the complete separateness that we experience when we are ego personality. Why is this important? This is important because we want to grow in consciousness, we want to grow in awareness. Why do you want to grow? <clears throat> Why do we want to grow? Because by the time we develop these personalities, we also have already created roots of unhappiness. Because we have become more and more separate. Right? The more we allow ourselves to be away from that unity, the more separateness we create, more suffering. See that? So why is it important to recognize? Because when we try to find a happy way of life, then we have to reverse the situation. We have to go in the opposite direction. We have made, made this very separate, very simple hierarchical ideas that we call the ego personality. We have to undo this various obstructions, the unity that we create, undoing requires the knowledge by which we did the trick. And now that we know the, what we have done, perhaps we can undo. This is why we say that, well, with the knowledge that now we have, the mechanisms that now are clear, some of it was clear even before, but not all. Now that it's, it's much, much more, more clear, maybe there are a few things more that we have to understand, but much of it we now understand. And with understanding comes the ability of undoing the damage, and therefore we may be able to get to greater and greater states of happiness. This is the whole idea of living this quantum truth of how the I, this separateness, this existence, part of it is existence manifesting, part of it is just the price that you pay for manifestation. Manifestation demands that there is a tangle hierarchy, there is an identification of the brain, there is no way that you can have experience by being separate from your brain. Truly, today, we have experience. I can call them experiments because they are quite objective. But really, they are experiences that people have when their brain is dead. They are dead experiences. They are part of them. Many people are reporting, even in India we have reports of that. It started coming from the West first because the, the technology is cardiology and this technology, brain is dead, people can divide this patient. It's very interesting. The truest wisdom is that the brain produces all the conscious experiences that we have, both subject and object. 
But for these people that brain died, we can see it from the EEG, these machines that measure brain waves. The brain waves say zero. No, 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 no brain activity. Then they are divided and they say all kinds of things. They say that they met Jesus or Buddha. That part can be divided. But they also say that they are hovering over their body in, on the operating table and then they describe the operation in such uncanny detail, like who sees during the operation, that possibly could not come without having seen the situation. So there must have been one scene, but who is seeing? There was no brain. In quantum physics, we have discovered the mechanism of this kind of scene. I won't go into it right now because let's cover certain other things, but I will remember this. When we talk about reincarnation, I'll talk about that too. So this is a very interesting world that we live in. Many of these things that we are claiming, that there is consciousness outside of the brain, can be directly verified, and we have verified. It's undeniable. This cannot be debated. The people have seen with the dead brain, it just cannot be debated. You can ignore the data, that's what materialists, clever materialists do, but they cannot debate. You cannot say that you can cut it. No, it's not a mental thing. They are describing physical things that happen. They are witnesses. There are pictures of that. And still they are describing. Yeah. Many, many such things. Many such cases. Whole, book, whole books have been written about such. So what has happened is that certain things we are discovering today that we just could not think about in the modern day. And it has given us a certain completeness of knowledge on which we can give the scenario or how to go back to that original being much better. And this is why I claim that by making a university which will start a unified teaching of science and spirituality, an integrated teaching of science and spirituality, we can produce beings of transformation. Enlightenment is just a word that if you can produce students who have a certain amount of happiness, who have a certain amount of rightness in their behavior, wouldn't that be much better than produce and produce and produce people who eventually only destroy the world being more separate than this being. I was talking about uh, what you said about the brain activity. So I had an experience like that. Uh, and I was very dead. Like, so, and I had an experience that not, not many people believed after I became conscious. So I was quite afraid to tell that to people. I thought it was just imagination. When it, these things are talked about, books are written about it, but there's no documented evidence that it actually happens. So is there documented evidence that it actually happens? That's what I'm saying. That, that what you had, what you had. Yeah. But other people had what you had. Additionally, they also had the experience of hovering over their operating table, and they saw details of the operation that even could be photographed, and later on has been photographed. And indeed, those things that they described, we can document it, that we have to really have okay. So in, in effect, there is now no doubt if, of the fact that people, from their experiences, we can construct this simple fact. Before the belief was that there is no consciousness without the brain, now that has to give way to the assertion that yes, there is consciousness even without pain. Okay? So, what we get from all this is of course that we understand how the self came about. Tangled hierarchy, conditioning, and then the 
ego persona. So remember this. The next question is also very important. What do we experience? We have done the first part. The most difficult thing is that how is the experience created? Why is this I experience experiencer? How did that come about? Because that's not even an object. It's quantitatively different. Now we have seen how consciousness become divided into a part that sees, the experiencer, the I, and the part that is seen. But now let's get into this part that is seen. This part is also very important. Right? Why is this part important? Because we know that if if I look immediately, I find that my experiences are two qualitatively different things. Part of the experiences are what you call internal, inside of me, subtle. I cannot share them with others. And part of the experience seems to be external, and I can share that with everybody. If I see that I am seeing Sayas sitting on a chair right in front of me, will anybody object? You may, because you are not seeing his face. But you come here and say, oh, yeah, yeah, I see it. Right? We can get a consensus. But if I say that I am seeing or visualizing a horse right now, can you all agree that, yes, I am visualizing a horse? What if I am that? I am a liar person. Right? You don't know that. I may be lying. So just by, if I say that I stay a horse, you don't necessarily believe me because you cannot share that. If what I say, I say a horse, if you could also say a horse, that would be different. But we can't, right? This is why we call them internal. Thoughts are internal, feelings are internal. This is why you can deceive each other. I'm saying to you, Hi, how are you? I'm so happy to see you and I'm burning inside. Oh, she looks so pretty and I'm so ugly. Right? Happen? More often than you think, more often than you like, but it happens. Right? Internal. So this external internal, this dichotomy, it produces a lot of uncomfort, discomfort in ourselves. Right? If our experiences were always pleasant, what does that mean? What does it mean to say pleasant experience? It means that it's not causing as much suffering. Suffering means it's suffering. Let's first realize it here. What is suffering? Suffering is separate. The more separate I feel, the more I suffer. If my experiences inside were not tainted by the agents of separation, uh, my suffering would diminish. So knowing my internal ecology, how the inside object, ex external objects we know fairly well, thanks to our time. They have studied these external objects, they have studied them very thoroughly, and we know a lot about but we have not correspondingly developed a very good theory of things and data of things that are internal. First of all, it's a little bit difficult to get at. Second of all, we have to depend on subjective experiences and scientists have always been very suspicious of subjective experiences, so they have not paid much attention to it. The ancient people did pay some attention to it, but they too depended on meditative capacity for people to do that. Why is meditation needed? Just look at your own internal experiences, which you'll do now, and you will see how difficult it is to get a clear idea. Even today, even when we examine the insight, you know, if you are honest, you have to admit that no, the objects are not so easy to discern. Even now, we really have to analyze the objects that we experience inside to get a clear picture of what are we 
experienced it. But let's do it. Let's do the exercise. Let's see why we are together. A great mentor, uh, fantastic people around us. This is really awesome, you know. And uh, we uh, should try and uh, make a full use of this opportunity for all of us. Yeah, it's not uh, uh, easy to bring so many great people together, so many great souls together. Yeah. So just before I, uh, you know, share with you a couple of perspectives, I just wanted to do what I call is a little bit of an audience analysis here, yeah, so that I can target my message a little bit more clearly to you. So uh, how many, how many of you? Uh, uh, this is the. Uh, uh, yeah, well, how many of you? Uh, how many of you are practitioners of uh, any therapy? Oh, quite a bit. Interesting. Thank you. Uh, how many of you have self healed yourself? How many of you are therapists and self healed yourself? Okay. And how many of you have been through a near death experience? Okay. Wow. And uh, how, for how many of you this is the first time exposure to the word quantum and the world of quantum? Okay. Uh, how many of you have got it 100% what Amit has been talking about since the morning? 100% you've got everything he said. <laughs> yeah, 100. First of all, 100. Then 90? Over, over 90? Okay. Uh, over 50? Less than 50? Pretty good. Okay, pretty good, pretty good, Amit. This is great. <laughs> this is okay, instant uh, uh, gratification and recognition for your talent. Thank you. Uh, okay, so that's wonderful. So I wanted to share, you know, what my, uh, because that's my takeaway that I can share with you from whatever I have seen in the last couple of years, what I've seen in this workshop, what I've seen happen in the last two, three years, and so on and so forth. So the bottom line here, you know, I try to simplify it for myself because you know, that's the only way I can communicate to the rest of the people who I work with. Firstly, I think uh, the big message that comes out through the learnings from Hamid is you can create your own destiny. Yeah, that's my takeaway. Yeah, yes. because this whole debate about you know whether you know all oh, this is predestined or not. My daughter believes this predestined. Don't even bother about doing anything. For example, in my own family, right? <laughs> And uh, here I have been struggling with this, but now I'm clear, as I say, yeah, that you can, and this is one of the benefits of quantum uh, education, which I think we should all recognize, that you can create your own destiny. And if there's nothing new, man proposes, God disposes. We've heard that before, right? <laughs> so, uh, uh, you know, that's great. So it makes it easier now to help people make a decision, yeah. The second is that you can choose not only make your own destiny, but you can choose between different choices. Amit, correct me if I'm wrong in any of my conclusions, please. Amit. Yeah, so you can choose, and uh, you know, this is the uh, this this is very important because if you can figure out uh, the best choice for yourself, which is your gift and purpose in life, wow, you got a winning formula. Yeah, I've noticed that a lot of people struggle on this issue, and they are not clear. You know, they are vacillating between this, that and the other and they're getting lost and all that. And really one technique that helps that a lot is meditation. Because you get it, you get the clarity from meditation, right? So if you can answer those three, four questions, you know, who are you, why are you here and all that stuff, uh, you know, you unlock the second key to happiness, yeah? The third is we now have the technology to make it happen, yeah? The technology is his teachings. He's told you about this wave, how they collapse, you know, how you can convert thought, etc., uh, uh, consciousness, and how the, you know, it manifests into reality and so on and so forth. So the whole process of how it happens, yeah, is now visible to us. And if you get that piece, uh, that is again a very, very powerful piece because you can then make all the parts work and make the transformation which is necessary. Yeah, so you've got the clarity, you've got the technology, you've got the transformation going in your favor. Yeah. Uh, the fourth thing is, and very important, because this is another thing that you know we a lot of us miss out on, uh, is the balance. We've got feet in two boats, right? In the spiritual world and in the material world. Yeah, we can't lose sight of that. Yeah, and uh, I liked your uh, illustration, uh, Amit, uh, that you said that you know we have to make these uh, these things happen concurrently. Yeah, you just can't abdicate and disappear, uh, you know, to the forest uh, and say you know you've got nothing to do with life. Uh, 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 you know, that's too passive an approach. So, 
Uh, and I remember you mentioning something very interesting that you felt that one of the major reasons for Alzheimer's was lack of interest in life. Yes? To some extent, I'm right? Yeah? So to keep your mental, you know, mental abilities alive and your interests alive and your energy levels right and all that, you have to participate. You have to participate in the right direction, in the right things in the world. And the fifth was, I think again a very, very important, that we have to return to authenticity. There's too much spin in the world, there's too much fake, there's too many people, and the big problem here is the whole attitude towards money. Yeah? I just want to give you an illustration because this is something I very passionately personally believe myself. If you, if there are two thought processes, you want to do something, you have one thought process is, okay, I want to make five crore rupees in two years time, right? And then you start thinking how you're going to do it, right? Versus, I want to set up a healing center, yeah, which will be the best in the world, and it will focus on these kind of people and do these kind of things, yeah? And I'm going to do them in a quality way, authentic way, I'll be honest, transparent and all that, and money will follow. You have that belief. Can you imagine the difference? Just think about it for 30 seconds, right? The difference in the approach, the culture of the company, the methods you have deployed, the positioning, uh, positioning that you have in the marketplace, etc. How that will vary. Yeah. Unfortunately, we are living in a world right now where 99% of the people are going route one, and that is a major problem uh, in the world today. And you know what we are trying to convert through all this is actually people to route two. Because there's so much to be done in this country that we haven't even scratched the surface quite honestly. Yeah? And therefore we do, and there is a huge entrepreneurial opportunity for the quantum of uh, you know, entrepreneur uh, to really take on you know, uh, 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 an authentic approach to business. And I can tell you something, I've traveled to so many places in the world and one of the places I go to everywhere I go to, I ask the local people, take me to the local restaurant which is run by the mom and pop show. Take me to the most popular you know, local restaurant which is really a reasonably priced, and everywhere in the world is the same story. You know, it's a family-owned place, it's authentic, it's reasonably priced, it's high quality, it's simple, and it works. You know, and I've seen so many examples of this kind of business everywhere. It's an absolutely fail-proof formula for total success. Yeah, but unfortunately, people in this race and they forget all that. Yeah. So I encourage you all to please think about this. Uh, these are my takeaways. Yeah, I practice some of these. I and Amit came together because in my search. Uh, of uh, you know of trying to uh, find how I'm going to implement my purpose in life. I met him in Honolulu, uh, in Honolulu at the uh, Quantum University uh, annual conference about two years ago. Uh, you know, I said he's an Indian. Let me catch him. You know, which I did, and uh, we became friends over a period of time. Uh, we've been talking and walking together. You know, talking the same language. He inspired me to set up the Quantum Institute for Wellbeing, which is uh, a community that we have uh, in the process of creating. All of you are welcome to look at the website. Uh, it's, uh, I'll put it up on the board before I go this evening. Uh, have a look at the website. So it's a community model, right? If it's bringing practitioners of uh, alternative and integrated medicine together with seekers who are looking for these kind of practitioners, right? So doctors need patients, patients needs doctors, that's the assumption behind it. Dr. Hegde, uh, Ahmed, and, you know, and some other great, great people are involved with us. We had a great meeting uh, in Delhi uh, a few days ago. We are very confident that, you know, what we are doing is very powerful, it's a high purpose objective, and uh, we're getting a lot of divine support, right, including, you know, the time here to come, and so on and so forth. So, those were my takeaways. Thank you very much uh, for your patient sharing. Uh, we will, uh, you know, sort of give you the website, have a look if it resonates with you, come join the party. Yeah, sit in the boat with us and row with us. Yeah, thank you very much. Can you tell me your personal experiences from spirituality and the quantum science? Oh my God, that's too large a question to answer. Very, very no, no, it's not for me. It yeah. is given inclination to this uh, group. Okay, I'm on the journey. Yeah, it's uh, right at the beginning. I'm not uh, anywhere near a master or anything like that. I'm learning. No, yeah. you are a master. No, no, no. no. <laughs> we are all masters in that respect. Okay, but uh, I'm basically a banker, chartered accountant, you know, gone into the spiritual, uh, you know, sort of inkling to, uh, to pursue my own dream. And uh, I'm having fun, I'm learning, you know, and I'm trying to practice and I'm feeling great because I think I'm becoming a better, better human being. Yeah. Uh, I travel a lot and I, you know, one of God's gifts is to 
we have to see new paradigms versus old paradigms. I feel that this is a sunrise kind of activity in the world. A huge demand, you know, for this kind of learning, education, uh, you know, interaction, so and so forth, which needs to be fulfilled in public service. You are very. Another question. Another question. Okay. Very short description of him is in terms of our work. He is a true karma yogi. Thank you. Thank you. We can talk about that. Yeah, yeah. Hold up, everybody. Very good. You are reinforcing it one more step further. And uh, then the second thing is, you, Don't said, even doubt it. you have you have a choice. So I was wondering, but actually, do you have a choice but to create your own destiny? No, destiny. I think uh, you. I think you have a choice. Yeah, you can just sit still. And a lot of lazy people do it, and it's okay. I mean, that, that's what they. Yeah, no, no, so no. you have a choice. You have a choice both ways. You have a choice to create the destiny that you want. You know, let it just sit there and let it happen to you. Whatever happens to you. Yeah, and the second thing, you also have a choice of what kind of destiny you want to create. That is true. Both, you have choice. You have no choice but to create your destiny. That's what I was no, thinking. Like, yeah, well, even, I, even not doing anything, you will get, create some destiny. No, but no you won't manage destiny. That's like the semantics of that. Yeah. You just have a choice. Okay, thank you. Thank, thank you. you.